So, Alain, this is really exciting. We've been working together for several years now, and your book uh, that really is the com summary of things you've been working on for your whole lifetime is just about to come out. How long have you been working on this book? Well, I decided to write this book uh, 18 years ago, but I've been really working seriously on it since I joined the Marin Institute, you know, practically full time. That's about five years ago. Yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, I'm, I'm very proud of what we were able to make possible through the, through the Institute. My, my grandfather used to tell me, it's not what you do, it's what you get done. And yes, by helping yes. to kind of provide some air cover there at the Marin Institute, I'm, I'm really pleased that we gave you the well, space uh, and inputs to help you f complete this book because it's it'll be, I think, well, transformative in, I, in urban uh, planning. I am very grateful that, uh, uh, you know, to add this opportunity because I think, you know, the isolation of uh, being, you know, an international consultant living in the suburbs, yeah. uh, I think will have prevented me from finishing it. I will have always this yeah. idea, I will write chapters, paragraphs, yeah. but it was only at the Maron with the, you know, let's say the stimulant of discussion yeah. and, uh, and the intelligent discussion, you know, yeah. people were, were, were interested in it, yeah. that I could finish it. If and not, I would and it's a sign it. of the, the beauty of cities, because yes, exactly. I came to yeah. New York to set up this new institute I didn't know who you were, I didn't yeah. know who Solly was, yes. but fortunately in a city as big as New York, there are some people who are extremely talented and extremely skilled in areas that I was not, and that was what made the, right, the institute yeah. and work. And we, we complement each other, yeah. you know, that, that's, a, that's an important thing. We, we have skills which are rather now in a certain yeah. way, but uh, if we work together and we, we understand each other, then we can produce things which can be very interesting. And it's also so helpful to disagree with people. Absolutely. Like I was going to say that, you know, from my perspective, what I've learned from you is all about how important it is to have a plan. And so for me, I would have said, well, it shouldn't the title be, uh, or to have a design, so order because of design, or design makes order possible. Why did you uh, choose the other, the other title? You know, because our background is, in fact, opposite. You know, you are an economist, right. and in a way you discovered uh, urban relatively late in your career. Exactly. It was not your prime. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it was opposite. Uh, I did my study at the Ecole des Beaux-Arts, so we always thought that design is a solution for everything. And, and, and remind people, like, who were you studying with at, uh, at Beaux-Arts? Uh, well, uh, you know, at the center, it was not at the Bazaar, but I interrupted my, you know, one year at the Bazaar, where very long studies, uh, to work with Le Corbusier in Chandigarh, in Canada. India. Okay. Yeah. And so that was, so design was considered to be the solution to everything. You know, even you looked at slums and you say, well, uh, the problem with slums is the house are badly designed or the streets are badly designed. If you design nice streets and, and good houses, there would be no more slums. Yeah. So yeah. The, that was a solution. Right. And it was not only the bazaar. When I arrived in New York, uh, I was working for the City Planning Commission in 68, and there was this project in Harlem uh, to cover Park Avenue. The idea was to build new housing in Harlem and Poverty, you know, the problem of poverty and the social problem of Harlem in 68 mm -hmm. were going to be solved by better housing, you know, better design housing. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so uh, for me, I discovered uh, economics uh, relatively late, when I was 30, 30 years old. Uh, by chance, I had a colleague who was an econ urban economist, who was uh, one year younger than me, and uh, we compare our notes, you know, I compare yeah. what I have observed in my life on cities, right. and I thought the, it was kind of a idiosyncratic things about cities, and uh, my economic uh, colleagues told me, well, there are a lot of literature about those things. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, for instance, uh, uh, why cities which are growing, you know, keep growing, and, uh, you know, why cities are growing, yeah. and why, uh, you know, large cities, even if they look ter terrible, are more productive than small yeah. cities. And, and I remember one conversation we had where you were describing driving through Harlem and looking around and saying to yourself, 
There's nothing wrong with these houses. Right, yes, yes. <laughs> these nice brown stones. That's right, so, yeah. Uh, and I, that remark has always been Well, always that was, what, you know, basically, I've been, uh, I've been learning through just uh, walking through street and looking and asking myself why things are like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, in a way, you have to relate it to, uh, maybe it's a little pompous or pedantic to say Hegel. Uh, yeah, yeah. Everything which exists makes sense. <laughs> and where you see in, in a lot of literature, especially uh, the, the urban planning literature, you see the word uh, cities are out of control or haphazard. Right. Right. Yeah. No city is haphazard. Islam is not haphazard. Right. Um, but but the, I think the fun part of our, you know, our engagement over these uh, many years is, is the convergence from very different perspectives. To right, an economist, yeah, yes. the idea you can have order without design, that right, seems yeah. just kind of take that yes, as given. Yes. And the surprise for me was to understand there is a kind of design and plan which is incredibly important. Right. I guess, and you know, what you taught me was in some sense, the architects were like the polar opposites of the economists right, yeah, who, yeah. Uh, who believed everything right, was yeah. designed and right, there was yeah. no market process. Yeah, yeah uh, you know, but basically uh, cities are created by people. Yeah. They are not created by urban planners mm -hmm. or architects. They are mm -hmm. created by people with different ideas, different talent. Some of these people fail sometimes, some succeed. Yeah. And the idea of a city is that at the end there are more people succeeding than failing. Mm. Uh, so it's people where... Yeah. And by, you know, by the way, I'm actually working right now on the lecture I'm going to go give in Sweden. And I was yes. going to say, progress doesn't happen. People make progress. Oh, but absolutely. maybe I should add to that when I come to, to cities. Yeah. People make cities. <laughs> That's part yes. of how they make people progress. People make cities. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. And so that's why I'm a little bothered when I hear a new mayor, for instance, having a vision. Yeah. You know, yeah. the vision comes from the people who are in the city. Right. And right. some have a terrible vision, some have a very good one, yeah. and eventually the good one will survive. But a mayor is, uh, uh, you know, is basically, uh, you know, a very, he should be a very competent and good janitor. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to make, make yeah, many yeah. friends that way. But, <laughs> but I, I have to tell you that in my social I engagements here in yeah, New York City, yeah. I bump into some of these very well-known architects. Oh, right, and, yeah, uh, yeah. I always have fun explaining to them, oh, you're, you're an architect, I'm an economist, you know, we're actually mortal enemies. <laughs> right, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Or sometimes I say, well, you know, oh, you guys, you're the ones who still believe in that Soviet style, uh, right, you know, yeah. central planning. Right, and, yeah. uh, yes. It's always an interesting way to get a conversation started. Right, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, let me, actually, let me, yeah. let me ask you a specific question. I'm increasingly persuaded that there are some abstract concepts that are very helpful, like one I have learned from you, which is that a city is a labor market. Right. In the early stages, yes. and early in development, yes. that's the way to think of a city. Right, yeah. But then there's this process of, of getting the kind of the radical specificity of, oh, this building, this street, this decision. So, so the, and, that, and it's the confrontation with those specifics that helps us refine the, the abstractions. So where did you get, so you mentioned New York City, where, where were the places where you got the exposure to the specifics where, uh, where it really shaped your, your thinking and revised your thinking? Where did you start? What countries had the biggest impact on you? You know, uh, my very early experience, so I was 23 years old, was in Chandigarh. You okay. know, I went to Chandigarh as, uh, you know, this was for me, uh, you know, the, the, the mecca, I mean, mm -hmm. the, for, for, for an architect. And was this, you know, was this one of the first new cities that uh, Le Corbusier worked on, or? He was only one, that's only one event, really yeah, right, okay. yeah. Yeah. where everything was planned. Right. And so it's very, if I had just visited Schendiger as a tourist, right. I would have probably admired, you know, the, the pretty nice building that Corbusier built there for the government. Okay. Uh, the wide avenues, you know, maybe it was, uh, you know, uh, parks, I would have park. If you live there, everybody you go to work, suddenly you see the city in a different light. Mm -hmm. You have friend in the evening, you meet your friend in the evening, you go to a cafe, uh, you need new clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, and then in Chandigarh, uh, you know, there was a, a commercial area which was entirely designed. And, okay. you know, there was no room for expanding it or, mm -hmm. you know, it was already there. Uh, and uh, most of the things 
we wanted, my colleague and I wanted, whether we wanted to go to a cafe or uh, where, in fact, uh, it is slums, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, built on the side of Shandiga, uh, where most of the workers were, were living. Yeah. That's where we will find, uh, you know, cafe to have tea at the time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, I remember having the need for new clothes, too. Uh, it, it, I had a tailor. It was uh, ready, you know. It was made on measure, you know, yeah. in in the slums. You know, there was yeah. no way uh, in the commercial area. You had only government emporium and things yeah. like that, which yeah. uh, were absolutely not interesting. So the so the the slums the slums were the place where these market like mechanisms could operate, where you could just go get things that you wanted. That's and right. Yeah. Close, yeah. close proximity. And this uh, spontaneity, you know, yeah. this grassroots thing. You know, how many tailor shop do you need? How yeah. many Barber shop? Do you need? Yeah. Uh, no planners know that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so was that one of the first places where you started to see the slum? Right. Yeah. Not as pathology. Yes, but, uh, but, uh, especially because I compared it to the before going to Shandiga. Yeah. I had my idea about Shandiga already. Yeah. You see, I was expecting a perfect machine, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, and I realized uh, no design. Uh, is a perfect machine. You know, the, you need a grassroots. You need a grassroots uh, movement. You know, the, a city is a grassroots movement. Yeah. Now, to get back to the subject of the book, yes, there is design, but uh, you you have to know exactly where to stop the design. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, as this book, I mean, I'm an architect planner as a as a origin. So this book is yeah. is really addressed to people what I call who are in the trenches, yeah. you know, who are yeah. doing the job, taking the hard decision. Yeah. And I think that uh, if they sin, it's by designing too much yeah. and not yeah. understanding grassroots. When, when I cook, my response is always, well, if a little good, little bit is good, a lot will be even better. Right, and what yeah. you need to learn is, well, there may be a kind Ex of a just right amount and you don't want to go beyond that. That's exactly it. Yeah. That's yeah. exactly yeah. it. Yeah. Well, keep, keep me going through. Uh, the, there were so many places you worked. Um, where, where else? Uh, you, soon after Shandigar, weren't you in Algeria? Uh, yes, yes. And then, yes. Then uh, where else was really? Al Algeria was also a. Algeria was, uh, you know, I was 26 at the time, and uh, I've not completely finished my studies, by the way, not my final thesis. Okay. But, uh, uh, but because Algeria has been newly independent, I had suddenly a job, you know, as inspector de urbanisme, where <laughs> I was in charge of building pyramids. Yeah. And to my dismay. Uh, you know, I had a staff who would look at uh, you know the, the request for building permit, yeah. compare them to the Code de l'Urbanisme, was a big book mm -hmm. like a Bible, and uh, most of the the requests for building permits were refused because there was some violation of the code. Mm. So the first two or three days, I was so intimidated by the job, uh, I signed, you know, I, I rejected those yeah. permits because they were all, the on letters the were, of your staff, yeah, on yeah. The, the letters were already typed, I had right. only to sign. Right. And, but I look at the plan, I thought those were very decent houses and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they, in a way, the Algerian were trying to get back to the traditional housing design in Algeria, mm -hmm. and the code was imposing, in fact, the, the suburbs of Paris. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> and so I realized, so I felt, the third day I felt really bad about right. it. Yeah. And I went to see the prefet, who was my boss, you know, the prefet of the department. And he was a young guy like me, with as little experience in bureaucracy as I had. And I asked him, can I use common sense to give building permits <laughs> rather than the code de l'urbanisme? And the guy say, why? Yes, go ahead. So it was completely legal, of course, but uh, at the time, you know, two years after Paris Algeria, we get away with it. Yeah. And so I start giving building permits based on only on, on what I thought was was right, and right. so practically giving yeah. building permit to everybody. You know, I mean, this reminds me of a, another example that that I love, which was that the the U.S. took its system for federal regulation of, of air traffic control and safety, right? Yeah, and they were able to just copy that, replicate it in China. Yes, teach the, they rewrote the rules for China. Yes. taught everybody there how to do it, and it worked extremely well. The, the, yes, yes, the contexts were so similar. Right. Yeah, but I think often. We get what we get is something like the rules for the suburbs of Paris get imposed right, in, yeah. in Algeria where they don't work well. Right. Yeah. And so the question is how to 
you know, tell the difference between something that's a system of rules we can copy versus ones where you really need much more uh, you know, adaptation. Yes, cities reflect culture. Yeah. Uh, culture are different, and rightly so. I think that makes the world interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so people make different trade-offs. You know, again, yeah. economists will understand that. Yeah. We'll, uh, so we'll may put different value to different things. Yeah. And uh, so regulation should never freeze right. trade-off. Or, 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 perhaps, that, uh, or perhaps when we write a legalistic rule, it should cover only those things which apply universally. Right, And yeah. those things where you can tell there's some local variation, don't try and pin that down with a rule. That's what you want to let, let happen. Especially when the user see what the outcome is. Yeah. You know, for instance, if you decide what is a setback in a house, mm -hmm. whether a house is allowed to have an internal courtyard or not, uh, the user will see that mm -hmm. and will know that they will have preferences. Yeah, yeah. So here you should not legislate that. You should not regulate that. Yeah. Now, uh, for instance, firemen know better about fire, mm -hmm. and they might say, uh, if a house has three mm -hmm. floors, we need a staircase uh, which is located there or so. Right. This what's I have no problem with that right. because the user here. Have no have no experience about right. fire mm -hmm. and is not able to say what is a good fire regulation or not. Right. But anything which is quantitative, right. uh, which is which is seen you know, like the area of uh, a house, right. whether there is a setback or not, uh, people are able to make the difference. Yeah. So why not let them the choice? Right. Unfortunately, regulations are going more and more into the detail of that. Yeah. In a in a way. You have a, a planner or a regulator right. who have a, a type of house in view yep. and he's trying to design by proxy yeah. through regulation. Yeah, so we've, we've talked many times about how to kind of draw the line if you're, you've got a continuum from n no plan to everything planned. Correct, like, yeah. where, do you, where do you draw the line? But it sounds like this discussion should also extend into if you're setting up rules, how do you implement them? And... Uh, from financial services, we've developed this notion of principle-based regulation. Right, yeah. You don't try and specify every detail, right. but you specify, here's the thing you have to achieve. Right, this yeah. is the goal that's important for, you know, like the fire department. Right, and yeah. then you can regulate based on um, delivering what's required rather than just some narrow set of measures of right, yeah. you know, legalistic conformity. For me, the first thing where you have to absolutely enforced regulation uh, is a separation of what is private and what is public. Yeah. Uh, the right of way of streets yeah. uh, have to be set. There is no, by the way, there is no scientific way of doing it, right. but it has to be designed in advance. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you have uncertainty about where a street will go, uh, it's very, very difficult for the private sector to build, to invest. Yeah. Uh, it creates also a lot of uh, corruption. Yeah. Well, this is, this is the point on which you and Sully have really changed my thinking, that this mm -hmm. definition in advance of what's the public space and what's the private right, space. Yeah. The public space I refer to is this, it's the space for connectivity that the government will have to manage because it always involves connecting many different right, people. Yeah. Yes, but right, that, yeah. that grid for connectivity and protecting environmental Part of some environment. You that know, that uh, seems to me now to be the number one priority. It's just essential right, to get yeah. that. Yes, and right. I've often said to people, everything else that you might want to do in a plan, you can, you can do later. Right, yeah. And uh, uh, try to restrain yourself yeah. also. In, yeah. you know, you are not, if you are a regulator in a city, you are not you know, this city do not, does not belong to you. Mm -hmm. uh, it it belongs to people who will come, and right. some you never know. Some people who have different tastes from you, mm -hmm. different, completely different preferences, and you have to respect that. Yeah. So now, that's, a, that's a big difference. But now, tell me more. I know you've worked in many other places around the world. Right, so we've yeah. got uh, Chandigarh, we've got Algeria, where, and then New York City. Where, right, where yeah. else? Well, uh, for me, I uh, work in San Salvador, you know, El Salvador, Central America. Okay. In Bangkok also, a year, okay. you know, a year and a half in Bangkok. Uh, and, but for me, really, one of the breakthroughs, let's say, in my understanding of cities, yeah. was working in Russia right after the fall of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. and in China in 82, 83 when I started, which was still, you know, they were trying to reform, but it was still a very much Maoist uh, yeah. setup.
Which, which cities did you work on in China? Uh, Shanghai. Okay. You know, my yeah. first project, uh, I was with the World Bank at the time, and the project was uh, putting sewer in about 60% of what Shanghai was at the sort of built up area. So my job as an urban planner was to find what were the density, what were, were the likely densities, yeah. all the city will expand, which way it will expand, right. uh, and this type of thing. Yep. Uh, and at the time also, the Chinese uh, were interested, they realized that they had to do some housing reform, you know, they wanted to, mm -hmm. in a way. And they, they asked me to look at it, although it was, uh, it was to stay confidential yeah. at yeah. the time. But yeah. that to me was a discovery, first that uh, my Chinese and Russian colleague were extremely skilled. The outcome of what they have been doing was pretty terrible. Yeah. You know, very skilled people in the wrong institutional framework hmm. uh, produce the wrong outcome. Right, right. It's like your experience as the permit uh, issuer in Algeria right, yeah. taught you that Basically, you in, as a government official should be doing less. I think right. the problem in many places when they see the bad outcomes, they think, "Well, we just have to do more exactly. of what we've been doing." Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you know, for instance, uh, well, in New York, there was this case where uh, you know the Seagram Building uh, was built, uh, if I remember well, in sixty-two, sixty-three. You know, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a very prestigious building, very expensive. Uh, but it was very nice. The plaza in front of the, yeah. the Sigram was nice. The regulator at the time, and I was part of the team, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, thought, well, this uh, Sigram building is so nice. Why don't we regulate New York so more Sigram building will be built? Right. This is a terrible mistake. Yeah. And yeah. so we gave an incentive. And again, the, the consequences were heavy because in order to force people to build this wonderful design, right. we had to limit floor ratio so that we would give a bonus of floor ratio uh, to, uh, to, in order that people will do the design. And yeah. you do not uh, make uh, you know, good designs for regulation. Yeah, yeah. So that, you know, our conversation started out about these two endpoints and then finding the middle point. Right, yeah. I, I think the, one of the most interesting things for me is to recognize that that middle point is something that will evolve over time. And that it's been, especially in the early stages of the building of a city, it's important to yes. focus on the most important things like defining public versus public private. Facet, right, and yeah. that other things uh, other things can uh, can come later. Right, absolutely, yes, yes, yes. And, and that so when, you know, for our work at, in the, at the Merritt Institute on helping developing countries. We're very focused on that public space, private space. I think that's absolutely right, yeah. yeah. I think that's absolutely right. And, and uh, the other regulation, uh, you, know, my, you know, again, fire or sanitation might be important, but, mm -hmm. but those will come later yeah. and can always be adjusted, where right. this separation of uh, public and private cannot be. You know, when uh, you have some slums in Nairobi or, or in Mumbai, which are several kilometers across. Yeah. So uh, here it's extremely difficult to, to have again a normal uh, labor market work because accessibility in the middle of the slum will yeah. always be terrible. Yeah. We have that also in Cairo yeah. or things like that. You know? When I talk to people about these ideas, one of the things I use to explain yeah. why the public space is so important is just to say, can someone walk a reasonable distance, half a kilometer, get on a bus that can go down a right, street yeah, yeah. that could take them yeah. to their job. Right, and yeah. if you don't have those streets that the buses could run on, you've killed the city as a Absolutely. labor market. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's not only transport, it's yeah. also garbage, for instance, or sure. you remove the garbage of yep. the city. You know, yep. if uh, you have only pedestrian lane on more than a kilometer or two, they, this is very difficult. Yeah. When you were helping with the sewer in Shanghai, yes. I assume you face the same problem that we face every time we try and retrofit. It, which is that there's very little public space you could use to go lay the, the in sewer In the lines. case of Shanghai, no, not so much. Uh, sometime in the suburbs, but not so much, because, uh, you know, the city at the time of Mao has not grown very much. Okay. You know, or, uh, oh. the, 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 you know, the, the, the pre-reformed China were not very urban. You know, there was an emphasis on a rural commune and things like that. Mm -hmm. So the city has densified enormously, but really 
mostly on the things which were built, uh, I would say, before the revolution. I see, so there was, there was a plan that there, was there still There was a plan, yeah, which was still there, most. yes. It well, okay. was still there, yes. Yeah. And uh, so it was not, and there were rural roads, you know, yeah. along uh, which people, so it, no, that was not a major okay. problem. Yeah. The, the problem was, uh, densities, you know, whether those densities were going to stay, whether yeah. uh, we will have to, or, or they will evolve. Right. And right. that's where economists, by the way, are very good at, right. Uh, right. you know, if you want to make prediction on their cities, uh, yeah. price and their cities sure. when you have a market. Sure. And again, another point that I could understand, but I could also see why it was so important to make to urban planners is that Density is not something you regulate. Uh, it's yeah. an outcome. It's, an it's outcome. determined it's an by some outcome. process. Yes. You can influence the things that help determine it, but you can't mm. legislate density. Right, yes, so. yes. You know, uh, an example is in Mumbai, where, uh, you know, the, the regulators in Mumbai have been always uh, obsessed by congestion. Yeah. Therefore, they want to reduce densities. Therefore, they keep a floor ratio low. That means the number of floor very yeah. low regulatory. Yeah. Uh, they have the highest densities in the slums, you right. know, density of more than 1,000 people per hectare. Mm -hmm. And in the, the area where they have high rise building, the density is about one third and one fourth, yeah, what right. they have in horizontal things. So, so you right. see when you, you restrict density in one area, but in fact it increases, and uh, richer people who can afford to live in apartment, high rise apartment, yep. have much lower densities. Yep. Yep. Um, well. Do you want? I, I know you spent time in South Africa, and um, yes. uh, that that was also kind of revealing in terms of the distortions you can end up with in cities because right, of a yeah. kind of yes. bad planning. Well, uh, you know, in South Africa, uh, you know, apartheid. Uh, I would say it's a mother of all zoning. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it's a uh, it's always zoning uh, got berserk. Yeah. You know. Uh, yeah. And so it, it was a, a learning experience there. Uh, s you know, sadly enough, I realized there that if apartheid fell, it was not because the horrible human implication of uh -huh. applying apartheid. It was because it was grossly uneconomical. I see. That they, were, they were keeping the, the cities from even functioning. From functioning. Yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah. so uh, the, the decision of the, the government at the time, the apartheid declared government, mm -hmm. was really, he had some very good economists mm -hmm. who told him, we cannot continue that way. Yeah. You know, it's just not, a, you know, it's not viable as, an, as a modern economy. The, yeah. So that was for me also a, a, to see the evidence, and the evidence here is provided by economists, yeah. not by urban planners. But if, but if people want to see the, the results of some of these decisions, you have these wonderful three-dimensional plots of density right. that I think people can still go see on your on your website. That's right, and yes. see, or yes. in the book, I guess. In the uh, book, yeah, yes, actually, yes. Oh, the, the cover of the book, uh, yes, yes. By, and by the way, the book is beautiful. The the color images came out extremely yes, well. Right, yes. I don't know, I don't know what you had to bargain away to get them to do it in color, but it, it, it's, it was a long bargain. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but it was but it was. You see, my both sides then was uh, was useful. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but but so people should buy the book just to look at the images, <laughs> including these three D images of the kind of the distorted spatial patterns right, that yeah. can emerge in many yeah. of these. Many of these well, places. if I if I had the talent, I would have made a book entirely of cartoon, you know, like a cartoon. Yeah. I think it would have been okay. very effective. Right? Well, that's, an, that's the next <laughs> book. <you know? laughs> yes. um, any last things about what excites you now? Uh, I, know yes. that, I know that transport strikes you as this suddenly very uh, kind of exciting area. Absolutely. We are now on the verge of first uh, expansion of cities, of very large cities. Yeah. Uh, cities were of more than 10, 20. The Chinese now, in uh, they are developing cluster cities, uh, which will have between 50 million to 120 million people. Yeah. Uh, these cities, you know, there is already one, uh, the Pure River Delta. You know, is mm -hmm. uh, you know Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, mm -hmm. uh, uh, is already 62 million, yeah. and it's not completely an integrated labor market, but very right. close to it. Right. And. What is missing still is a, an urban transport system which will be adapted to this type of uh, urbanization. Right. And uh, I think that now the new technology 
in more so, you know, for instance, the, the ability to be able to price mm -hmm. the use of road. Yep. Instead of having uh, user, you know, the road being free, every, uh, pricing the use of road without creating a traffic jam, you know, yeah. because before yeah. we had tolls, but yeah. you could not put uh, The fact that we understand much <laughs> better also origin and destination, because instead of doing survey every two or three years, we have instant feedback by the you know, uh, GPS of yep. all sorts of things. Yep. So we understand movement in cities much better. And we will be able then to adapt transport to really the, the real demand, right. not something we project what would be nice, mm -hmm. uh, what type of land use would be better to use a certain type of transport, yep. but given the type of land use we have in those cluster cities, uh, what is the best? Uh, right. And of course, uh, electric, you know, one of the big things will be uh, electric engine, which will remove pollution from the city. Right. If we manage to get our electricity yeah. from renewable, then we also solve the problem of global warming, at least uh, for transport. Yeah. I, I was actually talking to a group in Europe uh, about a week ago and explaining this idea of the multipole city, right, yeah. where historically we really haven't seen more than one center pole. Right, yeah. Although it occurred to me that uh, New York is a little bit of a counterexample with, with Midtown and, and Downtown. Right, yeah. And, and I also wondered out loud for them whether La Défense in, in, Fran in Paris is an example of a new pole that was allowed. Yes, to... but you know it goes beyond that. Uh, in uh, if you take the the conurbation of New York, twenty yeah. million people, you know uh -huh. the, the the metropolitan area, seventy percent of the trips are from suburbs to suburbs. Right. Only thirty percent are within within uh, New yeah. York City, within Manhattan, sorry, yeah. Yeah. and or or from uh, yeah. suburb to Manhattan. Well, this is it's the same in Paris, by yeah. the way. If you, yeah. people think of Paris as a very yeah. centralized city, right. in fact, seventy percent of the, the yeah. trips. Yeah. This is why. We have this revolt in Paris right yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, Seventy percent of the people in suburban Paris have to rely on a car, yeah. uh, not a very efficient so, car. Yeah, but so you've you've persuaded me that uh, this multiple poles may not work, at, you know, very well at cities the size of twenty million, but cities at size of you know a, or an area of one hundred and fifty right, million yeah. might well. And then it's easy to think about. Okay, we need mass transit that handles right, the, yeah. the station to station right, kind of between yeah, the poles. Yeah. But one of the other just wonderful insights I've learned from you is that the the point-to-point -point transport is a complement to the mass transit. If you've got right. the tuk-tuk yeah. or the small right. vehicle or the yeah. taxi right. yeah. that helps people get to the station, helps them right. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. leave from the station they arrive at, or even just bypass the stations bypass for many the of these station. trips, yes, right. those things can work in you know, together to reinforce the mass transit system. Right, yeah. And the the usual mindset that we've got to somehow kill the point-to-point -point transport right, to yeah, get mass yeah. transit is really just completely Just uh, that's an error, yeah. We, you know, instead of uh, saying, this is the best mode of transport and everybody should use this, whether right. it's metro or BRT or something mm -hmm. like that, it's in fact a complement of door to station mm -hmm. or door to door yep. and station to door. Uh, yeah. So at a certain point, you have to have an individual or maybe a very small collective mm -hmm. on demand. It yep. has to be on demand. It cannot be right. a bus every half hour. Right. And then you'll be able to serve an area of 20, like 20 million people without having a lot of uh, uh, congestion and people losing yep. the congestion. So uh, let, let, me, let me go back to this, this idea of matching a few clear abstractions like design, like market, to the rich detail, uh, the, the specifics of uh, everyday life. The, there, you hear some tech people talking about these electric propelled uh, computer guided individual vehicles right, and so yes, forth. Yes. I found it so helpful when thinking thinking about the role of this kind of door to door, right, yeah. uh, door to station transport, right, yeah. to hear you talk about the, the tuk tuks so that <laughs> there is a, a precedent for this. And, yes, and yes. You might just want to say a little more about yes, how uh, the tuk tuks work. I found that, uh, you know, in India it's well known. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, you have a rickshaw, you know, which yeah. are waiting people at the stations. Right. Unfortunately, 
the railway company consider that they are in reasons, you know, right. that they, they create congestion. So they don't accommodate sidewalk or area where people could board easily. So yeah. indeed, it creates congestion. Uh, I found that also in China. In the suburb of Beijing, you know, at, if you go at the last station in the suburbs, you find this uh, little contraption, which, by the way, are still, I think, illegal, yeah. but they, they are tolerated. Uh, so it's a motorcycle with an enclosed uh, habitat, you know, mm -hmm. at the back. And uh, those people have cell phones. Uh, the part of the subway uh, which is suburban is usually outside, so you can call somebody on the cell phone. Mm -hmm. And those people are waiting for their client uh, at the station and bring them directly home. Yeah. In the morning, they pick them up at six in the morning in some apartment somewhere, which is pretty far from a bus station or thing like that, mm -hmm. and they just pick them up at exactly the, you know, if it's 610, they will come at 610. So it's good for them because they have a lot of clients that they can, you know, on appointment, Sequence, they don't need yeah. to roam. Yeah. And at the same time, it's perfect for the user yeah. too. Yeah. So I think that this is, a, uh, you know, it's, a, it's again a grassroots solution. You know, yeah. this yeah. was not planned, it was, it's even illegal. Uh, but it's a grassroots solution which show the direction. And, now, and which, you could I mean, modernize, of course, the but, vehicles. But, it, but it's also part of what makes the subway work. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It, it, it gives a catchment area, you know, the yeah. catchment area of yeah. the subway is much larger yeah. in a shorter time because yeah. of those vehicles. And again, it's a grassroots solution. So that's why okay. when you go around a city, you have always to open your eyes. And say, why is this existing? Why people prefer to take this tuk tuk rather than wait for a bus? Well, and you know, then you see the solution. Yeah. Well, let me just mention one of the great examples where you, the self-taught economist, gave me, yeah. the trained <laughs> economist, a really important economic insight. It was when you said to me, Paul, the cost of transport is the real estate. Right. It's, yes. the, it's the space in the street. It's the space. Uh, in the street. So yeah. if the readers find your uh, buy your book and read it, yeah. will they understand? Will they find the explanation for why it was important to have some tuk tuks where you can enter through the back? Is oh. that, is ah, that explained? Yes. I, I don't, don't, don't give it away. Uh, don't, yes, they need uh, yes, to go yes. read the book. To, uh, to, uh, uh, no, I, I, unfortunately, I, I, no, I, I didn't develop this aspect of the back. Uh, yes. Okay. Uh, but yes, oh. uh, transport yeah. is a real estate. You know, yeah. the street space. Yeah. is set up in advance. There is no way to adjust it after it's set up. Well, so, so, so there is no supply increase. You yeah. know, you can increase the number of houses. Right. You cannot increase the supply of houses. Yeah. So, but so if, we, if it's not in the book, maybe we should explain that if you yeah. can park the tuk-tuks very close together, too close to let a door open, oh, right. If they can, if people can enter from the back, from the, then you can line up many right. more tuk-tuks. Yes. Uh, and, and they can and they can leave you could, because they can leave directly. Yeah. You know, if anybody who has been at an airport, say a, a JFK yeah. or, or, or or anywhere, uh, knows uh, how inefficient our right. our system of of uh, yeah, you know, like, the well, long line people, of taxi, long board. line of uh, yeah. yeah, and yeah. Uh, because of uh, the, those uh, tuk tuk are are you know loaded from the back. Yeah. Uh, first, you need only, you have one every meter, practically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, instead of, uh, you know, a normal thing, you'll have three or four meters. Okay. And, and they go directly into the traffic yeah. as soon as they recline. And, and one other story that we'll have to save for another time, I suspect, because yeah. I don't think it's in the book, was the one that you started for me by saying, Paul, have I ever told you about the time when I had my appendix taken out with no <laughs> anesthesia? Yes, <laughs> that's not in the that's book. That's not in the no, book, no. but you know, maybe if, if uh, people pay attention on your website uh, or we have another chance to talk, we'll, we'll tell the story. <laughs> tell the story, that's another story, yes, yes. Good, Yes. well, it's been, it's been fun, we should do it again. Thank you, thank you, Paul.